So this is chapter 11 uh, about emotions and motivation. So without feelings, we have very little basis for rational decisions. So one of the biggest influences on our decision making is our ability to feel empathy. If we know a decision might hurt someone, we're less likely to make that decision uh, because we know what it's like to be hurt. Uh, so some people can't feel fear, which, you know, can be nice, but it also places them in danger of physical harm because fear is a warning sign of imminent danger. Additionally, research uh, suggests that emotions can sometimes help us think critically. Uh, in one study, researchers found that angry students were better at distinguishing strong from weak scientific arguments in research studies than their non-angry counterparts. So popular psychology tells us that many emotions, especially negative ones, are bad for us. A lot of books actually tell us that, um, tell people not to feel angry, not to feel guilt, etc., because it can kill plan accomplishment or dream for fulfillment. Like many exaggerated claims in popular psychology, there is a kernel of truth to this. Pop psychologists are correct that excessive and unjustified anger, guilt, etc. can sometimes be self-destructive. But they're wrong to suggest that we'd be better off without them because many emotions, even the negative ones, are crucial to our survival. So what is emotion? Uh, emotion is a mental state or feeling associated with our evaluation of our experiences. So one of the theories uh, of emotion is discrete emotions theory, and this believes that humans experience a small number of distinct emotions that are rooted in biology. Advocates of this theory propose that each basic emotion has its own biological roots, and they each serve one or more distinctive evolutionary function that are essentially the same in everyone. They further argue that because the brain's cortex, which plays a large role in thinking, evolved later than the limbic system, which plays a key role in emotion, uh, so our emotional reactions to situations come before our thoughts about them. Essentially, our emotional reactions are knee-jerk reactions, whereas our thoughts about events are more purposeful. So the fact that some emotional expression uh, expressions emerge even without direct reinforcement suggests that they might be byproducts of innate motor programs. For example, during REM sleep, newborns will spontaneously smile. Also consider the disgust emotion. There is good reason to believe this emotion has an evolutionary purpose. Discrete emotions theorists uh, believe that disgust reactions are evolutionary, evolutionarily adaptive. When you wrinkle your nose, contract your mouth, this increases the chancing of expelling uh, a food that disgusts you. And most of the food we find disgusting, like corpses or secretions, contain harmful bacteria. Other emotions prepare us for biologically important events. So when we're angry, we ball our fists, we clench our teeth, which readies us to fight or bite. When we're afraid, our pupils dilate, uh, allowing us to better see potential threats like predators in our environment. So Darwin was one of the first to point out similarities between the emotional expressions of humans and many non-human animals. Morton showed deep-seated similarities in communication across most animal species further suggesting that emotions of humans and non-human animals share the same evolutionary heritage. Of course, just because two things seem similar on the surface does not mean they share the same roots. However, in the case of emotions, all mammals share an evolutionary ancestor. The fact that many mammals display similar emotional reactions during similar social behaviors lends itself to a parsimonious hypothesis. Maybe these reactions share the same evolutionary heritage or origins. <clears throat> Another way to evaluate the hypothesis that discrete emotions are products of evolution is to examine the universality of emotional expressions. If humans evolve to express each emotion in a distinctive way, we'd expect expressions to communicate the same thing across cultures. 
Research has shown time and again that people in the United States and Europe generate the same facial and vocal emotional expressions across cultures. However, the alternative hypothesis is that they're similar because members of both European and American culture have both been exposed to Western culture, and the similarities may be due to shared experiences rather than evolution. Because of this, in the 1960s, Paul Ekman traveled to the wilds of New Guinea to study emotion expression. Uh, this culture still used Stone Age tools and had essentially been isolated from Western culture. Ekman and colleagues concluded that a small number of primary emotions, approximately seven, are cross-culturally universal. Specifically, they found that facial expressions associated with these emotions are recognized across most, if not all, cultures. Discrete emotions theorists call these emotions primary uh, because they're presumably the biologically based emotions from which other emotions arise. And they are happiness, sadness, surprise, anger, disgust, fear, contempt. Um, some research suggests pride, which tends to be associated with a smile and upward tilt of the head, uh, may also be cross-culturally universal. But other uh, research, research suggests that awe, the emotion we feel when we encounter something vast and mysterious, is also a primary emotion. Interestingly, the sounds associated with awe, like wow or ah, are cross-culturally universal. However, this evidence is still preliminary. In his work, Ekman found that happiness is the most easily recognizable emotion, and negative emotions are more difficult to recognize and distinguish between each other. So one problem with discrete emotions theory is that people across different cultures don't always agree on which facial expressions signify which emotion. Nevertheless, as discrete emotion theory would predict, the levels of agreement are higher than would be expected by chance alone, suggesting at least some cross-cultural universality in the recognition of emotion. Primary, uh, primary emotions don't tell the whole story, though. There's an enormous array of secondary emotions. So the idea that certain emotions exist across most or all cultures doesn't mean that cultures are identical in their emotional expressions. And this is due in part to display rules, which are cross-cultural guidelines for how and when to express emotions. In Western culture, parents teach boys not to cry, whereas they typically teach girls that crying is acceptable. Americans can be taken aback when a visitor from South America, the Middle East, or some European countries uh, greet them by kissing them on the cheek. In a study on display rules, uh, Friesen, Friesen uh, videotaped Japanese and American college students without their knowledge as they watched films, either while alone or with an experimenter. He asked people in each group to watch two film clips uh, or a neutral travel scene and one very gory mutilation scene. When they were alone, uh, students in both groups had similar reactions. But when an experimenter entered the room, culture became apparent. The reaction of the American students did not change, but Japanese students actually smiled during the gory scene to conceal their negative reactions. In most cases, culture doesn't influence emotion, but it does influence emotional expression. However, display rules may not account for all cultural differences. One study asked people to guess the nationality of Japanese or Japanese American students and found that people were more accurate at guessing nationality when emotion was shown, suggesting a cultural influence on nonverbal accents, which are slight differences in facial expression depending on one's culture. This suggests that culture can subtly shape how emotions are expressed. According to discrete emotions theorists, each primary emotion is associated with a distinctive constellation of facial expressions. For example, when we're angry, our lips narrow, our eyebrows tilt, or our eyebrows tilt downward. 
And we can differentiate between some primary emotions by looking at their pattern of physiological responding, even if the distinctions are fuzzy at times. Just altering our face in a way associated with a certain emotion can change our bodily reactions. Our heart rates increase when we're angry or fearful, but the two emotions have different physiology. When we're afraid, our digestion slows down, but it speeds up when we're angry. Brain imaging provides promising evidence for discrete emotions. For example, fear is pretty specific to the amygdala. However, in other cases, we can't distinguish between different emotions based purely on their physiology. One study found that happiness and sadness have very similar brain activation patterns. <clears throat> we can also use certain components of facial expressions to help us distinguish real from fake emotions. In genuine happiness, we see upward turning of the mouth, crinkling of the corners of the eyelids, and drooping of the eyelids. Uh, emotion theorists dis uh, distinguish this genuine expression called the Duquesne smile from the fake Pan Am smile, which is marked by movement of the mouth but not the eyes. As several researchers have shown, the Duquesne smile possesses predictive validity for important life outcomes. One study found that among individuals whose spouse had died recently, those who displayed Duquesne smiles in conversations were more likely to recover emotionally from their loss. This makes sense because they are still demonstrating genuine happiness, which could mean that they're finding happiness in new places or just places outside of their marriage. Emotions are largely innate motor programs uh, triggered by a certain stimuli, and our emotional reactions to these stimuli come before our interpretation of them. However, proponents of cognitive theories of emotion disagree. These are theories that propose that emotions are products of thinking. Uh, so the way we interpret a situation influences what we feel in response to it. If we see an upcoming job interview as a potential catastrophe, we'll be stressed out about it. Moreover, for a cognitive theorist, there is no discrete emotions because the boundaries across emotions are blurry. Some scholars argue that because thinking essentially determines our emotions, there are as many different emotions as there are different kinds of thoughts. <clears throat> so perhaps the oldest cognitive theory of emotion owes its origins to William James. Because Carl Lang came up with a similar theory around the same time, this theory became known as the James-Lang theory, and it proposes that our emotions result from our interpretations of our bodily reactions to stimuli. The example James used was, if we're in the woods and see a bear, what happens next? Common sense would say, uh, we'd be scared and run away. However, as James recognized, the link between our fear and running away is only a correlation. The link doesn't demonstrate that our fear causes us to run away. In fact, James and Lang argue that the causal relationship is flipped. We're scared because we're running away. They argued that our fear was the result of our physical state. Palm sweating, heavy breathing, running, increased heart rate, and that makes us afraid. Uh, one researcher found that patients with injuries higher in their spinal cord reported less emotions like fear and anger than did those with a lower spinal cord injury. Presumably, those with lower spinal cord injuries could feel more of their body and therefore could feel more emotion. So for anyone unaware, uh, the higher up a spinal injury is, the more paralysis a person could potentially experience. And the lower it is, the less paralysis they can experience. So just fun fact for the day. Some researchers have criticized these findings, though, because of a possible experimenter expectancy effect, which is a form of reactivity in which a researcher's cognitive bias causes them to subconsciously influence the participants of an experiment. Additionally, uh, there have been issues with being able to replicate these findings, which furthers the questionability of them. Few scientists today are strict believers of the James Lang theory, but it does still influence modern thinking. Damasio's somatic marker theory proposes that we use our gut reactions uh, to help us determine how we should act. 
According to this theory, if we feel our hearts pounding during a first date, we might use this information as a marker or signal to help us decide what to do next. Still, there's evidence that people can make decisions based on the basis of external knowledge and without any bodily feedback. One study examined patients who suffer from, from pure autonomic failure, uh, which is marked by a deterioration of autonomic nervous system neurons beginning in middle age. These patients don't experience increases in autonomic nervous activity like heart rate or sweating following external stimuli, yet they had no deal difficulty on a gambling task that required them to make decisions about monetary risk. These findings don't falsify somatic marker theory, uh, but they do make it a little questionable by suggesting somatic markers aren't necessary to make wise decisions. Next, we have the Cannon-Bard theory. So Cannon and Bard pointed out several flaws with James and Lang's reasoning. They noted that most physiological changes occur too slowly, often taking at least several seconds to trigger emotional reactions, which happen almost instantly. Cannon and Bard also believed that we aren't aware of many of our bodily reactions like digestive changes, so we can't infer emotions from them. They proposed that an emotion-provoking event leads simultaneously to an emotion and to bodily reactions. Using James's example, Cannon and Bard believe that when we see a bear in the forest, the sight of the bear triggers being afraid and running away at the same time. Even though they propose that the thalamus triggers both emotion and bodily reactions, uh, later researchers found that numerous regions of the limbic system, including the hypothalamus and amygdala, also play a role in emotion. However, Cannon and Bard's theory did encourage researchers to examine the basis of emotion within the brain. Schachter and Singer believed that the James Lang and Cannon Bard models were too simple. They agreed with James and Lang that our cognitive interpretations of our bodily reactions play a crucial role in emotions, but disagreed with them that these bodily reactions are sufficient for emotion. According to their two-factor theory of emotion, uh, two psychological events are required to produce an emotion. First is after encountering an emotion-provoking event, we experience an undifferentiated state of arousal, which is alertness. And by undifferentiated, they really just mean that this arousal is the same across emotions. It's not specific to happiness or sadness. It's just generic. And second, we then seek to explain the source of this arousal. Once we attribute the arousal to an occurrence, we experience an emotion. So once we figure out what's making us alert, we label that alertness with an emotion. For example, again, we'll use the bear in the forest. According to Schachter and Singer, we first become physiologically aroused, then we try to figure out the source of that arousal. Because we see the bear, we know we're afraid. And while this is a pretty good story, do our emotions actually work this way? Schachter and Singer tested the effects of adrenaline on physiological arousal. While the adrenaline was entering the system of participants, Schachter and Singer randomly assigned participants to either the condition where a confederate acted in a happy way while com uh, completing a survey, or where the confederate acted in an angry way when completing a survey. They found that emotions of participants who had received the placebo weren't influenced by the behavior of the confederate, but those who received adrenaline were. So for, um, for those who experienced the happy confederate, they reported feeling happier, whereas those who experienced the angry confederate reported feeling angrier. Because of this, Schachter and Singer concluded that emotion requires both physiological arousal and an attribution of that arousal to an emotion-inducing event. Support for their theory has been mixed uh, because not all researchers who attempted to replicate their findings were able to do so. Moreover, research suge uh, suggests that although arousal often intensifies emotions, emotions can occur in the absence of arousal. 
So which theory should we believe? As is usually the case in psychology, there's probably truth to all of them. Discrete emotions theory is probably right that our emotional reactions are shaped in part by natural selection, and these reactions do serve crucial adaptive functions. For example, we should be afraid when faced with a predator that could send us to the afterlife same day delivery. That's a normal reaction. However, discrete emotions theory might underestimate cultural influences and doesn't exclude the possibility that our thinking influences our emotions. The James Lang and somatic marker theories are probably right that our, inf our inferences about our bodily reactions can influence our emotional state. The two-factor theory might be right that physiological arousal plays a key role in the intensity of our emotional experiences, but it's unlikely that all emotions require such arousal. In recent years, <clears throat> researchers have been examining unconscious influences on emotion, which are variables outside of our conscious awareness that can affect how we feel. One piece of evidence for this uh, is automatic behaviors. So automatic generation of emotion. Uh, so as we've seen, uh, research suggests that a good amount of our behavior is produced automatically. And as we will see in future chapters, we are often unaware of why we do certain behaviors. However, we often perceive such behavior as intentional. So even though we may not know why we're doing it, we think we know why we're doing it. <laughs> Uh, and even though there is some debate about this, there are some who believe th the same might be true of our emotional reactions. So two investigators presented participants with a set of words describing positive stimuli, and another group received a list of words describing negative stimuli. These stimuli were presented so quickly that they were subliminal or below our conscious awareness. Even though participants could not report what they'd been shown, those exposed to the positive words reported being in better moods than those being, uh, who were shown negative words. Other research reports similar findings uh, for being shown subliminal facial expressions. Nevertheless, in recent years, these kinds of effects have become controversial, largely because they're often small in magnitude and difficult to replicate. Uh, some of these results might be due to demand characteristics and other experimental artifacts. Popular wisdom tells us that familiarity breeds contempt, meaning that the more familiar we are with something, the less we like it or the more negatively we view it. The mere exposure effect suggests the opposite. It suggests that repeated exposure to a stimulus makes us more likely to feel favorably toward it. It believes that familiarity breeds comfort. And this correlation could be due to the fact that we repeatedly seek out things we like. If you like pizza, you'll spend more time seeking out pizza than people who don't like pizza, or more so than you do food you don't like. And more evidence of this can be found in studies using meaningless stimuli that participants were not likely to have had prior exposure to, and they showed that repeated exposure to nonsense symbol, uh, syllables results in greater liking toward those stimuli compared with those with little to no exposure. And this has been replicated numerous times using various stimuli, which lends further credibility to these claims. There's also evidence that mere exposure can operate unconsciously because it emerges even when experimenters present meaningless stimuli subliminally. Even when people aren't aware of seeing a certain stimulus, they report liking it more than stimuli they had never seen. And mere exposure might even be more effective for conscious stimuli exposure. However, uh, there is a scientific controversy, controversy about just how long mere exposure effects last. Funny enough, no one knows why this happens. These effects might reflect habituation because the more frequently we encounter a stimulus without anything bad happening, the more comfortable we might feel when we encounter it. Alternatively, we might just like things that are easier to process because the more often we experience something, the less effort it typically takes to comprehend it. In turn, the less effort something takes, the more we tend to like it. 
For example, we like rewatching TV shows and movies because we know what's going to happen, and that makes it easier for us to process. For me personally, I can't tell you how many times I've seen Criminal Minds, Scrubs, or Godzilla King of Monsters. They are my comfort media. Another theory um, behind unconscious influences is the facial feedback hypothesis. So, if no one's near you and you don't mind looking a little weird, smile really big and hold it for about 15 seconds. How do you feel after doing that? And now frown really deeply and see how you feel after doing that. According to facial feedback hypothesis, blood vessels in the face feed back temperature information to the brain, altering our experience of our emotions. This hypothesis originated with none other than Charles Darwin, even though uh, Zajon rev uh, revived and expanded it in the 80s. Like James and Lang, Zajon uh, argued that our emotions typically arise from our behavioral and physiological reactions, but unlike them, uh, he believed this process is purely biochemical and non-cognitive, meaning it requires no thinking. There is some support for this. Uh, one study found that participants who engaged in a Duchenne smile showed lower heart rates immediately following their task, suggesting that their smiles had lowered their stress levels. However, it's still not clear that these effects work by means of facial feedback to the brain. An alternative hypothesis is that these effects are the product of classical conditioning. Over the course of our lives, we have been conditioned by both ourselves and those around us that smiling equals happiness and frowning equals unhappiness. Other evidence of facial feedback is mixed, though. Uh, in one widely cited study, researchers found that participants who held a pen between their teeth while watching TV, which essentially forced them to smile, found the TV shows funnier than those who did not have to hold a pen in their teeth. However, these findings have failed to be replicated. So a lot of our emotional expression is nonverbal. Um, I'm sure all of our parents had a look they could give us automatically that, to or that told us automatically we were in big trouble or about to be. Our nonverbal behaviors are often more valid indicators of our emotions than our words are, largely because we're pretty good at disguising our verbal language, but not so great at disguising our body language. So nonverbal leakage is the spillover of emotions into nonverbal behavior and is a powerful cue that we're trying to hide an emotion. So we often take for granted how important nonverbal communication is in our everyday lives. Without it, there could be a lot of miscommunication. Because of this, not being able to interpret or pick up on nonverbal communication can cause issues. Uh, for example, misinterpreting the tone of an email or a text. Additionally, some developmental disorders like autism spectrum disorder make interpreting and picking up nonverbal cues difficult, which can then lead to social difficulties. Uh, because of the prominence of nonverbal communication, people often think it's easier to interpret things uh, without it than it actually is. Psychologists refer to this as the curse of knowledge, which is when we know something like what we intend to say or what we're trying to say, we often make the mistake of assuming others know it as well. Our posture can express a lot about our emotional states. Uh, when interpreting the body language of others, we usually look to um, facial expressions and body language. For example, an uptight person can indicate happy, or an upright position can indicate happiness, but an upright position with a lot of tension can indicate anger. Some research on embodied cognition suggests that our postures can sometimes affect our emotions, uh, readiness to engage in certain behaviors, and brain physiology. For example, when people are insulted, they're more likely to react in anger when sitting upright than when reclining. Nevertheless, posture effects, while genuine, are short-lived. 
uh, gestures come in a wide array of displays. When talking, we use illustrators, which are gestures that highlight or accentuate speech, such as talking with our hands, which I'm sure you've noticed I tend to do a lot. <clears throat> when we're stressed, we might use manipulators, which are gestures in which we might press or bite parts of our bodies, especially like um, nail picking or lip biting can be common signs of stress. Additionally, we're all familiar with emblems, which are gestures that convey conventional meanings recognized by others of a culture, like hand waving or nodding of the head. There are some that are uh, common across cultures, like crossing your fingers for good luck, but there's also some specific to cultures, like a hand wave means hello in the United States, but can mean go away in some European countries. While body language can be a useful tool for communication, we need to exercise caution when drawing conclusions about its meanings for any given person. Many pop psychologists believe they can translate body language, but body language is not the same across people, especially when accounting for culture. One example is in 2012, Tanya Raymond interpreted that the fact that the Barack Obama um, put his hand on top of that of former President George W. Bush while shaking hands uh, was a power move. However, analyses like these can be problematic because it's impossible to entirely generalize body language across all people. And we also have personal space. So uh, there's a clip from Rick and Morty about personal space that came to mind automatically uh, when I was going, like when I was reading this section, but I'm not going to show the clip because I'm not entirely sure how appropriate it would be. Instead, I will be giving you my subpar PG reenactment of that clip. Welcome to Personal Space. I'm your host and I care about my personal space. Well, well, who's around me right now? <laughs> All right, let's get stepped up and step up some personal space in this place. One, personal space. Two, personal space. Three, stay out of my personal space. And it goes up to like nine, I think. So I'm not a huge fan of this show, but this clip just, I lose it every time. I can't even do a serious reenactment of it. And I'm hoping at least you maybe got a chuckle at my expense from that. So, proxemics is the study of personal space. Edward Hall observed that personal distance is correlated positively with emotional distance. The further we stand from another person, the less emotionally close we feel to them and vice versa. Uh, for example, children with autism spectrum disorder tend to prefer more interpersonal distance than do other children, maybe consistent with their lesser need for close emotional contact with others. Of course, like everything, there are exceptions. Uh, when we're trying to intimidate people, we get closer to them. We try to make them uncomfortable by invading their personal space. And according to Hall, there are four levels of personal space. However, the lines between them aren't very clear cut. So first we have public distance, which is 12 feet or more. This is typically used for public speaking, like lecturing. We have social distance, which is four to 12 feet, typically used for conversations among strangers and casual acquaintances. And I feel like everyone that's been through COVID will cringe at this phrase anytime they hear it after the quarantine and pandemic is over. And then we have personal distance, which is one and a half to four feet, uh, typically used for conversations among close friends and romantic partners. And then we have intimate distance, which is zero to 1.5 feet, typically used for kissing, hugging, and affectionate touching. And while these implicit, or when these implicit rules are violated, uh, we usually feel uncomfortable, like when a stranger gets in our face to ask us for a favor. Hall believed that cultures differed in what was considered personal space. Um, so in many Latin and Middle Eastern countries, personal space is relatively close, whereas many Scandinavian and Asian countries, personal space is more distant. Nevertheless, research does suggest that although these cultural differences are genuine, they aren't as large as Hall believed. 
And there are also gender differences, uh, with women preferring closer space than men. Personal space also increases from childhood to adulthood, maybe because children haven't yet developed clear interpersonal boundaries. Recent data suggests that even within cultures, personal space preferences are influenced by personality traits like fear proneness. Lie detection. So the polygraph or lie detector test has been one of the icons of popular psychology and media portrayal. It makes frequent appearances in basically every crime show ever. Even Dr. Phil has promoted the polygraph test on his TV show as a means of finding out which partner in a relationship is lying. The largest organization of polygraph examiners in the United States claims that the test is between 85 and 90 percent accurate. Others have cited even higher numbers. The polygraph test, like most lie detection techniques, uh, rest on the assumption of the Pinocchio response which is a perfect physiological or behavioral indication of lying. Like Pinocchio's nose, people's bodies should give away that they're lying, racing heartbeat, heavy breathing, twitching, etc. Modern polygraphs measure several physiological signals that often reflect anxiety, like blood pressure, sweating, and skin conductance, which is a measure of sweaty palms. The assumption is that dishonest people uh, experience anxiety when confronted with questions that expose their falsehoods. The most widely used version is the Controlled Question Test, or CQT, uh, which measures suspects' physiological responses following three major types of yes-no questions. First, you have the relevant questions like, did you do it? Uh, and these questions bear on the crime in question. And then you have irrelevant questions, so those that don't bear on the crime in question, like what their name is, date of birth, stuff like that. And then you have control questions, and these reflect probable lies. These typically inquire about trivial misdeeds, about which most people would probably lie, especially under intense pressure, like you know, being interrogated, that, that's intense pressure. But these questions are usually like, have you ever been tempted to shoplift? Have you ever shoplifted? Things of that nature. Uh, if the suspect's autonomic uh, activity following the relevant questions is higher than that following the irrelevant and control questions, polygraph examiners labor, label the results as deceptive. Although the polygraph does better than chance at detecting lies, it yields a high rate of false positives. So a high rate of innocent people that the test labels is guilty. And this means that the polygraph test is biased against innocent people. And as a result, uh, polygraph tests aren't admissible in most US courts. And the key problem is that the polygraph test confuses arousal with evidence of guilt. The polygraph test is misnamed. It's an arousal detector, not a lie detector. And many people display arousal following relevant questions for reasons other than the anxiety associated with lying, like, ooh, I don't know, the fear of being convicted for a crime you didn't commit. That would give me anxiety. In fact, psychologists have been unable to find a Pinocchio response. And these problems plague other popular lie detection methods as well, some of which have been proposed as potential methods of spotting potential terrorists at airports. Some agencies use voice stress analysis to detect lies on the basis of findings that people's voices increase in pitch when they lie, but their voices can go up in pitch when they're stressed out too. As many of us know, airports can be very stressful environments. In fact, voice stress analysis barely does better than chance at detecting lies. The polygraph might also yield false negatives, which is guilty people dubbed innocent. Many individuals can beat the polygraph test by using countermeasures, uh, which are methods designed to alter their response to control questions. To pass the polygraph, we need to exhibit a more pronounced physiological response to control questions than to relevant questions. 
With less than 30 minutes of preparation, half or most of participants can accomplish this goal by biting their tongues, curling their toes, or performing difficult mental arithmetic. Some psychologists argue that people with psychopathic personality who have low levels of guilt and fear may be especially adept at beating the polygraph test because of their low level of arousal and response to incriminating questions, but support for this is mixed. If the polygraph is so flawed, how are examiners convinced of its validity? The answer to this is probably in the fact that the polygraph is often effective for eliciting confessions, especially when people fail the test. As a result, examiners may come to believe that they are effective because they get results. Moreover, examiners frequently conclude that suspects who failed the test but didn't confess must still be guilty, but without hard evidence, this is unfalsifiable. The guilty knowledge test is another form of uh, lie detection. So to get around the polygraph shortcomings, Lycan developed the guilty knowledge test, which relies on the premise that criminals harbor concealed knowledge about the crime that innocent people don't. So to administer this, we'd make a series of multiple choice questions in which only one choice contains the object at the crime scene, like a red handkerchief, and we would measure their physiological reactions following each choice. If across multiple items, the suspect consistently shows pronounced responses to only the objects at the crime scene, we can be pretty sure that they were present at the crime scene and probably committed the crime. In general, evidence offers at least some support for the ability of the guilty knowledge test to detect concealed information. It also has a low false positive rate, and this makes it potentially useful as an investigative device for law enforcement officials. However, the test does, uh, does have a fairly high false negative rate because many criminals may not have noticed or since forgotten key aspects of the crime scene. Another method is brain scanning techniques. Several researchers have attempted to improve the guilty knowledge test by measuring suspects EEGs following each item, a te technique commonly known as brain fingerprinting. Brain waves may be more or maybe a more sensitive measure to the recognition of concealed knowledge than our skin conductance or other indices used by the traditional guilty knowledge test. Nevertheless, scientific support for brain fingerprinting is preliminary. One problem is that most of the evidence for this technique comes from lab studies in which participants are forced to rehearse details of a simulated crime. In the real world, many criminals may forget these details, leading to lower accuracy rates. Most of the evidence for brain fingerprinting hasn't been subjected to peer review, which is one of the safeguards against bad science. Other investigators have used fMRIs to help detect lies. Studies show that when people lie, certain brain areas often become activated. In principle, fMRI could be more sensitive than the polygraph at detecting lies, but there's currently no known brain signature for lying because brain activation patterns differ from person to person and across the type of lies. The brain activation for lying might have significant overlap with the activation associated with thinking about lying, which would mean that this technique would also have a high false positive rate. Then we have integrity test. So instead of using complex equipment to measure physiological reactions, an estimated 6,000 US companies, including McDonald's, administer pen and paper integrity test, which presumably assess workers' tendency to steal or cheat. These fall into several categories. So the first would be history of stealing. Have you stolen before? There would be attitudes towards stealing, positive or negative. And then there would be perceptions about others' honesty. So do you think people steal from their employers? So if you answer yes to one in three and a no to two, that will get you labeled as dishonest. Integrity tests uh, predict employee theft, absenteeism, and other workplace misbehavior at better than chance levels. But because these tests yield numerous false positives, their validity for detecting dishonesty is relatively weak. 
like the polygraph, uh, integrity tests might be biased against the innocent. According to one estimate, Americans spend roughly $2 billion a year on self-help advice. But as Daniel Gilbert once said, people have a lot of bad theories about happiness. To understand happiness, we first need to fact check some notions about happiness that are pushed by popular psychology. I'm going to go over uh, four findings covered on page 424 in the fourth edition. Um, it might be available in the earlier editions, but unfortunately, I don't know the page number for that. So the first major finding was that life events don't determine happiness. One study found that those who were the happiest didn't experience any more positive life events than did other participants. Another study done by Kahneman and colleagues found that life circumstances like income were essentially uncorrelated with current levels of happiness. The second finding is uh, money doesn't usually make us happy. Research tells us that a lot of money can't buy long-term happiness. However, Below an annual salary of $75,000 per person, there is a modest correlation between wealth and happiness. Above this number, though, the relationship diminishes. There are two exceptions to this trend. Uh, more money relative to other people we know might make us happier, and spending money on others tends to make us happier. So the first is related to social comparison. We regularly compare ourselves to those around us, so when we think we're better off than some of those around us, it can boost our relative social standing and make us a little happier. The second is related to gift giving. For me personally, I love giving people gifts and seeing them light up at the fact that they received a gift. The third major finding is that the elderly are typically happier than younger, than younger people are. Happiness tends to increase with age, at least through the 60s and 70s. Uh, surveys suggest that the happiest group is men 65 and older. Only when people start to get into their 80s does happiness decrease again. The increase in happiness with age seems to be due to the positivity effect, which is the tendency of individuals to remember more positive than negative uh, information with age. And this seems to be due to older people's tendencies to reflect on the positives of life. This effect is also accompanied by decreased activity in the amygdala, which plays a large role in the processing of negative emotions. And the fourth major finding is people on the West Coast are no happier than anyone else. While some want to paint the West Coast as a paradise, research shows that there's no significant difference in happiness levels between those on the West Coast and those elsewhere in the United States. Uh, those that think Californians are happy are probably falling into the availability heuristic. When we think California, we usually think beautiful beaches and warm sun, but tend to forget the cost of living, crime rates, and traffic. So some things that do make us happy include marriage, friendships, religion, experiences, and flow. Flow is the mental state in which we're totally immersed in what we're doing. Artists typically describe themselves as flowing when painting, writing, or performing. However, we should exercise caution when examining the correlations between these and happiness uh, because the correlations are modest and there are exceptions. For example, while married people tend to be happier than non-married people, there is still a lot of married people that are unhappy. Additionally, many of these findings derive from correlational research, so causal effects are unclear. For example, while flow experiences uh, probably contribute to long-term happiness, happy people may be especially prone to flow experiences. If research tells us anything about happiness, it's that seeking it out rarely works. As the concept of flow demonstrates, happiness often emerges from the sheer act of enjoying things, whether it be work, hobbies, or romantic partners. Happiness lies in the journey, not the destination. Um, however, people are pretty bad at affective forecasting, which is predicting our happiness. Our predictions aren't just wrong, they're usually wrong in the same direction. Uh, specifically, we overestimate the long-term impacts on our moods and display a durability bias, which is the belief that both our good and bad moods will last longer than they actually do. 
For example, people with anxiety are especially likely to overestimate the long-term impact of negative events, demonstrating the notion that anxiety is associated with an oversensitivity to potential threats. Additionally, we tend to underestimate how rapidly we adjust to our baseline levels of happiness or unhappiness. We forget that we're stuck on what Brickman and Campbell called the uh, hedonic treadmill, which is the tendency of our moods to adapt to external circumstances. Our levels of happiness adjust quickly to ongoing life situations. The hedonic treadmill hypothesis proposes that we began life with a genetically influenced happiness uh, set point from which we can go up and down in response to short-term life events. With only a few exceptions, we return to that set point within a few days or weeks. While these set points are relatively stable, they can shift over time following major life events, and this is especially true for negative life events like the loss of a loved one. Uh, there is a lesson here. Popular wisdom is right in that the grass always seems greener on the other side. Many pop psychology sources traced almost all psychological difficulties to one core problem, and that is self-esteem. If you look on Amazon, you can find so many things to help improve self-esteem, including books and audio tapes that are devoted to improving self-esteem. And self-esteem is simply the evaluation of our self-worth. All else being equal, high self-esteem isn't a bad thing. Self-esteem has been shown to be uh, to positively correlate with happiness, satisfaction with life, and other constructs typically considered to be positive and negatively correlated with loneliness, depression, and anxiety. However, contrary to popular belief, low self-esteem is not the root of all of our problems. This belief perfectly demonstrates a single factor explanation because it vastly oversimplifies the role of self-esteem in our lives. The evidence linking self-esteem to life success is relatively weak. People with high self-esteem aren't more likely than people with low self-esteem to have good social skills or to do well in school. They're about as, and they're about as likely to abuse alcohol and drugs. However, when it does come to aggression, things get a little more complicated. Most pop psychology literature links aggression to low self-esteem, but evidence suggests that a subset of people with high self-esteem are especially prone to aggression, especially when confronted with ego threats. These people are narcissists. So I, I think this is a really cool chance uh, for a neat history lesson. So Narcissus was a figure in Greek mythology who rejected all romantic uh, advancements and eventually fell in love with his own reflection in a pool of water. He then realized he, how he felt about his reflection could never be reciprocated, and he melted away to the fire of passion within himself. And this is where we get the term narciss uh, narcissism. Narcissism is a personality trait, and in some cases, personality disorder, uh, characterized by extreme self-centeredness. So, one of the most famous narcissists, she was actually a malignant narcissist, was Elizabeth Bathory. Uh, and for anyone unaware, she largely inspired some of the lore behind Dracula. Basically, um, she killed young girls and would bathe in their blood to preserve her youth. And I want to differentiate here between malignant narcissist and regular narcissist because malignant narcissism tends to be accompanied by other personality disorders like antisocial personality disorder, paranoid personality disorder, or sadistic personality disorder, whereas regular narcissism is just narcissistic personality disorder. And another important distinction I want to make is someone can have narcissistic tendencies without meeting the clinical diagnosis criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. In one study done by Bushman and Baumeister, they found that those with high self-esteem also had high levels of nar or who also had high levels of narcissism responded to negative evaluations with aggression, but non-narcissistic participants did not display aggression. Other studies show narcissism can increase the risk of aggression, especially in response to criticism. For example, high self-esteem students who are narcissistic retaliate against teachers who give them bad grades by writing negative course evaluations. 
Additionally, in adolescence, the combination of narcissism and self-esteem increases the likelihood of engaging in bullying. Uh, these findings suggest that high self-esteem is more of a risk factor for aggression than is low self-esteem, especially when someone's high opinions of themselves are challenged. Research also suggests suggest uh, two different varieties of narcissism. There's grandiose and vulnerable. Those with high levels of grandiose narcissism tend to be flamboyant, charming, and domineering, and tend to brag about their achievements, but those with high levels of vulnerable narcissism tend to be introverted and preoccupied with themselves, as well as being oversensitive to perceived minor slights. Narcissism has some interesting implications for real-world behaviors, like leadership in the business and political worlds. For example, uh, while it is a fictional work based on true events, Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Wolf of Wall Street would be a great example of a grandiose narcissist. Narcissism, especially grandiose narcissism, seems to be a double-edged sword in that it has both benefits and detriments. For example, narcissistic individuals tend to rise to positions of leadership more quickly than do other individuals and excel at job interviews, probably because they make great first impressions. But on the other hand, narcissistic leaders tend to exaggerate their accomplishments, are overconfident in their decisions, and tend to put their needs ahead of those of the company. Oddly enough, narcissistic bosses tend to be liked more than their non-narcissistic counterparts. Narcissism might even predict presidential success and failure. One study found that presidents that were grandiose narcissists were more forceful and persuasive leaders, and they were more likely to have mistreated their subordinates and been the subject of congressional impeachment resolutions. One question that has been posed recently is if the levels of narcissism are increasing over time. While psychologists largely disagree on the answer to this, there is some research showing that levels among high school and college students have been increasing over time. According to them, a lot of environmental factors like overprotective parenting have contributed to a substantial increase in self-centeredness. Regardless of what the right answer is, one thing is for sure. We should keep an eye on those with high levels of narcissism, especially grandiose narcissism. <clears throat> so clearly, high self-esteem has some disadvantages, especially when it's of the narcissistic variety. However, research uh, suggests that self-esteem by itself has several benefits, along with somewhat more happiness and social connectedness. High self-esteem is associated with greater initiative and persistence, as well as resilience when experiencing stress, but these findings are correlational and may not be causal. Self-esteem measure, self measures are also more predictive of specific life outcomes when they're more specific themselves. For example, while self-esteem itself is not a predictor of school performance, self-esteem regarding math ability is correlated with performance in math classes. So self-esteem is also related to positive illusions, which are tendencies to perceive ourselves more favorably than others do. So most high self-esteem individuals see themselves as more intelligent, attractive, and likable than do low self-esteem individuals, but they don't score any higher on objective measures of these characteristics. Again, this is based in social comparison. Uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation here, though, because causal effects regarding self-esteem are a sticky gray area at best. And it's hard to determine their self or if their self-esteem leads to them to believe they are higher up than those around them, or if there are circumstances of their environment that make them believe that, boosting self-esteem. A slight positive bias may be adaptive because it lends us the self-assurance we need to take healthy risk, like applying for that job we really want. Positive illusions may also be good for romantic relationships, at least when they aren't too extreme. For example, if a man believes himself to be a god walking among men, that positive illusion would be very detrimental to his dating life. Additionally, when positive illusions are too extreme, they might lead to psychological difficulties like extreme self-centeredness because these biases may prevent us from benefiting from constructive feedback. 
A lot of recent research has done little to encourage people to achieve their full emotional potential. For example, some researchers have argued that popular psychology has underestimated people's resilience in the face of stressful life events, but other scholars have contended that psychology has focused excessively on the negative side of human nature and underemphasized the capacity for pro-social behavior. Since the turn of the 21st century, positive psychology has been gaining a lot of traction. Positive psychology is a discipline of psychology that has sought to emphasize human strengths like resilience and coping. It also focuses on helping people find ways of enhancing positive emotions like happiness as well as building psychologically healthy communities. Pearson and Seligman outline several character strengths and virtues they view as essential to positive psychology. Several of them like love and gratitude are correlated with satisfaction of life. Across the country, positive psychologists have begun to teach students to incorporate these strengths and virtues into their daily lives. In fact, controlled studies suggest that at least some positive psychology interventions, like expressing gratitude to others on a regular basis, tend to be modestly helpful in enhancing moods and combating depression. Some aren't convinced, though. Uh, Lazarus has dubbed positive psychology as a fad whose claims don't have enough scientific evidence to support them. Additionally, negativity has some upsides, too, like making us introspective. Research uh, suggests that inducing negative moods in participants tends to make them more polite, less prone to rely on stereotypes when judging others, and less selfish. Putting people in bad moods even makes them less susceptible to things like fundamental attribution error. Norm observed def uh, defensive pessimism, which is a strategy of anticipating failure and compensating for this expectation by mentally over-preparing for negative outcomes. If you've ever heard the phrase, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, that's what they're talking about. This helps people improve performance because it encourages them to work harder. Moreover, optimists, uh, rose-colored glasses, and tendency to gloss over their mistakes may sometimes prevent them from seeing reality clearly. For example, optimists tend to recall feedback about their social skills as better than it actually was, which may prevent them from learning from their mistakes. None of this takes away from the value positive psychology brings to the table, but it does remind us to be wary of one-size-fits-all solutions and single-factor explanations to multifaceted problems. So we've talked about how we experience emotions, but to understand why we do things in response to them, uh, we need to dig into the psychological forces that push and pull us in different directions. Motivation is the psychological drive that propels us in a specific direction. When we're motivated to do something, we're pushed toward or away from it. While popular psychology loves motivational speakers, there's really no evidence for any long-term benefits from listening to them speak. So one of the most influential concepts in psychology is drive reduction theory, which believes that certain drives like hunger, thirst, and sexual frustration motivate people to act in ways that minimize negative emotions. From an evolutionary perspective, drives are geared to ensure our survival and reproduction. However, some drives are more powerful than others. For example, thirst is a stronger drive than hunger because we can survive longer without food than we can without water. Most drive reduction theories believe that we're motivated to maintain a certain level of psychological homeostasis or equilibrium. One factor that influences our drives is arousal. So according to the yerkes dodson law, there is a quadratic relationship between arousal and performance. So in non-statistical terms, this means that we perform our worst when our arousal is either very high or very low, and we perform our best when it's at a moderate level. Each person's level of peak performance is different, but most of them are around the middle moderate level of arousal. When we're below the optimal point, we're usually not motivated and don't perform well, but if we're above that optimal point, we're usually anxious and don't perform well. Uh, this also depends on the complexity of the task, with more complex tasks shifting our optimal point to a little higher than it is with a simple task. This law is very popular among sports psychologists and coaches. They try to push people into that optimal motivation zone. 
According to the yerkes dodson law, when we're under aroused, we seek more stimulation. Low levels of arousal might drive us to explore new things. Certain drives generate tendencies toward approach or predisposition to certain stimuli like food, but others generate tendencies of avoidance or predisposition away from certain stimuli like rude people. Lewin noticed that, two t uh, that these two types of drives often conflict with each other, uh, but two approach drives can conflict and so can two avoidance drives. The avoidant gradient is typically steeper than the approach gradient, uh, which means that as we approach our goals, our tendency to avoid them increases more rapidly than our tendencies to approach. And this explains why we often agree to do things months in advance, but when it's the next day, we dread having to do it. While drive reduction theories have contributed a lot to psychology, they don't explain why we engage in behaviors even when our drives are satisfied. Because of this, psychologists have recognized that drive reduction theories of motivation need to be supplemented with incentive theories, which propose that we're often motivated by positive goals. Many of these distinguish between intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation, or more commonly, internal or external. If you're intrinsically motivated to make art, you're driven by your passion for painting. If you're extrinsically motivated to make art, you're driven by your desire to make a profit. There's evidence that certain rewards we may expect to reinforce our, our intrinsic motivation might actually undermine it. Lepper and colleagues found that children given a reward were less interested in drawing than those who did not. Many believe these findings imply that when we see ourselves performing a behavior to obtain an external goal, we conclude that we weren't really all that interested in the behavior in the first place, which results in a lower intrinsic motivation. However, other researchers have offered alternative explanations, uh, one of which is the contrast effect, in which once we receive reinforcement for a behavior, we anticipate that reinforcement again. If the reinforcer is gone, we won't be motivated to perform that behavior. Remember, under operant conditioning, removal of the reinforcer leads to eventual extinct extinction of the conditioned response. However, there is a chance that this is an oversimplification, and our behaviors are likely driven by both intrinsic and extrinsic motivations. So some human needs take precedence over others. Some uh, theorists like Murray distinguish between primary needs or biological necessities and secondary needs, psychological desires. Murray identified roughly 20 secondary needs, including the need for achievement. According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we need to satisfy our primary needs before we can progress to satisfying our more complex secondary needs. Maslow's hierarchy is most often portrayed as a pyramid, and as we move up the pyramid, we move away from needs produced by drives and toward needs produced by incentives. Uh, this hierarchy reminds us of something often overlooked. When people are starving, they usually aren't concerned with abstract principles of psychological growth. However, his approach isn't perfect. Although some needs are more crucial than others, research has found that those who have not achieved lower levels of the pyramid can still achieve higher ones. So starting at the bottom, we have physiological needs. These needs are to satisfy hunger, thirst, and fatigue. Second are safety needs. Uh, these are needs to feel secure and safe. Third, uh, belongingness and love needs are needs to be with others, to be accepted and belong. Fourth, uh, self-esteem needs are needs to achieve, be confident, gain approval and recognition. Cognitive needs are needs to know, understand, and explore. Aesthetic needs are needs to appreciate beauty, order, and symmetry. Self-actualization needs uh, are needs to find self-fulfillment and realize one's potential. And lastly, transcendence needs are needs to find spiritual meaning beyond one's immediate self. If we're lucky, we won't know hunger pains very often or for very long and can refuel. But 
for a lot of less privileged people, hunger is a part of everyday life. While feelings of hunger are uncomfortable, they are integral to our survival. Our hunger and thirst motivate us to eat and hydrate ourselves, which provide us with energy and nutrients. If food is available, we eat when we're hungry, and when we're full, we stop eating. This is less simple when we consider that inside our bodies, a complex series of events that govern hunger and eating. One early idea from Cannon and Washburn is that stomach contractions cause hunger. They found that students' reports of hunger were associated with muscle contractions, but this is just a correlational finding. Scientists found that people still report hunger pangs even when their stomachs have been removed or when surgeons cut the nerve to the stomach responsible for stomach contractions. And these findings contradict the stomach contraction hypothesis. While children point to their stomachs when they're hungry, the brain is a much better command and control center for hunger cravings. Scientists discovered that the hypothalamus plays several roles when it comes to eating. For one, they found the lateral hypothalamus plays a key role in initiating eating. Another study found the lower middle part of the hypothalamus plays a role in hunger reduction, and when lesioned, rats ate far too much. However, these distinctions are not black and white. A complex sequence of events mediated by different brain areas and body regions orchestrates eating. For example, a hormone produced in the stomach called ghrelin uh, communicates with the hypothalamus to increase hunger, whereas another hormone called cholecystokinin, uh, cholecystokinin decreases hunger. Additionally, the hypothalamus plays a role in changing levels of glucose as well. According to glucostatic theory, when our blood glucose levels drop, hunger creates a drive to eat to restore the proper level of glucose. Glucose is just one of the ways through which we achieve homeostasis. When our glucose levels drop substantially, we generally feel hungry, but levels of blood glucose can be variable and don't always mirror the amount or types of food we eat. It's possible that eating when we're hungry influences our level of glucose, not the other way around. In fact, our self-reported hunger and desire for a meal are better predictors of energy intake, um, our meals better predictors of energy intake are meals over a three-day period than our glucose levels. In today's society of readily available fast food, all-you-can-eat buffets and oversized portions, seriously, like compared to the rest of the world, American portions are huge. I even have a little picture here for you guys. Like it's ridiculous. People usually eat more calories than they need. When we eat a candy bar, some of that glucose is stored for fat for long-term energy. The more, <clears throat> the more stored energy in fat cells, the more they produce a hormone called leptin, which signals the hypothalamus and brainstem to reduce appetite and increase the amount of energy used. Researchers discovered that mice that lacked the gene for leptin production became obese at a young age. Additionally, obese people seem resistant to the effects of leptin. Individuals who are obese find food difficult to resist because they think about food a lot and find the tasty qualities of food rewarding. The sight, smell, or thought of food in our environment can trigger neurotransmitters like serotonin, triggering the reward circuit of our brains. Additionally, those that are obese may overeat for comfort or distraction from negative emotions. Another reason obesity is challenging is because each person has a set point that establishes a range of body fat and muscle mass we tend to maintain. When we drop below that set point, mechanisms kick in to boost our appetite or decrease our metabolism, which makes weight loss difficult. You may have heard this colloquially being called starvation mode. <clears throat> and we don't know what sets the set point. Compared with thin people, bigger people may be born with more fat cells, lower metabolisms, or less sensitivity or greater resistance to leptin. And this may explain why some bigger people don't lose weight no matter how little they eat, where thinner people don't gain weight no matter how much they eat. 
However, some findings raise questions about the set point hypothesis. Levitsky and colleagues determined the amount of calories consumed during a 14-day baseline and then overfed participants. Participants were then allowed to eat whatever they wanted, but they did not restrict their intake enough to return to baseline levels as predicted by the set point hypothesis. One thing is clear though, most individuals can maintain and modify their weight within limits through diet and exercise. Genes probably play a huge role when it comes to weight as well. In about 6% of severe obesity cases, there is a mutation in a major um, melanocortin-4 receptor gene that is responsible for severe obesity. Those with this mutation never feel full, regardless of how much they eat, so their brains don't tell them when to stop eating. Some other genes, like the leptin gene, have been identified, but a combination of other genes associated with appetite, amount of fat stored in the body, and metabolism most likely work together to increase the likelihood of obesity. And genes don't completely determine our weight either. External cues like time of day, opportunity to see others eat several portions of dessert, and expectations also play uh, prominent roles in food consumption. One likely influence is the supersizing of portions called portion distortion, in which portions in America supersede those elsewhere in the world, likely leading to part of America's obesity problem. Portions have increased for both food and beverages. Coke bottles increased in size from 6.5 ounces to the current 10 ounce bottle. For example, look at the drink sizes of just a couple fast food places. So like McDonald's, Whataburger, and others have giant drinks. So typically, if you order a meal from one of these places, you receive a medium drink, which is 21 ounces at McDonald's and 32 at Whataburger. Both of, <clears throat> like I said, both of which that's the standard size you get when you order a meal. One study found that participants who ate soup from bottomless bowls, and these were bowls that were automatically refilled using a tube, uh, ate 73% more than those who ate from standard bowls. Because we tend to think in terms of units of things as the optimal amount, and this is called unit bias, controlling portions of food consumed is a good way to control our weight. People eat about 25% less chocolate when it's divided into smaller pieces, than when there's a single item with the same total amount of chocolate. Schachter proposed the internal-external theory, uh, which believes that obese people are motivated to eat more by external cues than from internal cues. For example, they may be more motivated by the sight and smell of food than by a growling stomach. One study supported this, but another possibility, which is favored by research, meaning that there's more support for this possibility, suggests that oversensitivity to external cues is a result rather than the cause of patterns. So there is a surgical option for a significant weight loss, and this is bariatric surgery. So some people can't lose significant amounts of weight no matter what they try. And many people who are severely obese or whose weight jeopardizes their health um, have the option of participating in bariatric surgery to achieve long-term and significant weight loss by restricting the amount of food their stomach can hold. And when they say when someone's weight is detrimental to their health, they mean in severely obese people. Um, but one thing I do want to point out here is severe thinness is also detrimental to health. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. I mean, like, um, like rail thin, below what you should be for weight, like stuff like that. That's also not great for your health. Um, and the most common form of this is gastric bypass surgery, uh, where surgeons reroute food into a small pouch that connects the small intestine, that connects to the small intestine. Uh, bypassing the stomach. And this is generally a safe surgery, but all surgeries have risk and complications can happen. Uh, another important note here, if you do, you know, if someone does opt for bariatric surgery, it is important to stick to the post-surgery diet they prescribe um, because it is possible to regain all the weight. Um, I I actually know someone this happened to. It was a, she was a good friend in high school, so... 
if you pay for the surgery and you go through with it, make sure you stick with the post-surgery diet as well. All right, next we have sexual motivation. So sexual desire called libido is the wish or craving for sexual activity and sexual pleasure. And this is deeply rooted in genes and biology, but can also be influenced by social and cultural factors. So the sex hormone testosterone can sometimes increase sexual interest in the short term, especially in men, but other biological influences are also uh, at play. For example, Low levels of sexual desire have been associated with high levels of neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is why antidepressants can suppress sexual drive. Because typically, if you're depressed, your brain doesn't have enough serotonin, so antidepressants boost the production or reuptake or absorption of serotonin. On the other hand, higher levels of dopamine have been associated in or been associated with increased sexual desire. Medicines that decrease serotonin and increase dopamine and norepinephrine can be prescribed to those with low sexual drives like premenopausal women. Many believe that men have higher sex drives than do women, and that stereotype might hold a tiny kernel of truth. Compared to women, uh, men desire sex more often, experience more sexual arousal, want to have more sexual partners, and desire sex earlier in a relationship. However, women tend to experience more variability in their sex drives, and women, especially those with higher sex drives, tend to be more attracted to both men and women and are more fluid in their sexual orientation. In contrast, men tend to be attracted to one sex or the other. Now, I do want to note um, that this does not mean that bisexual and pansexual men don't exist. They absolutely do. This simply means there is a statistical tendency for men to be attracted to one sex or the other. So compared to men, women's appetite for sex, but not their need for romantic tenderness, does tend to decrease after they form a secure relationship. Of course, you know, there is a lot of individual variability within people. These are just general trends. Additionally, a lot of this sort of research focuses primarily on the gender binary of just men and women, largely ignoring other gender identities. So early in marriage, uh, couples on average have sex about twice a week. As people age, this frequency decreases, but their sexual satisfaction does not. And this is possibly due to people expecting their sexual drive to decrease as they age, so they aren't disappointed when it does. Contrary to popular belief, people are sexually active well into their 70s and 80s, especially when they're healthy, not depressed, are in happy marriages, and perceive that their partner desires a sexual relationship. One study found that between ages of 40 and 80, 79% of men and 70% of women reported having sex in the previous year. And women experience complex changes in their hormones during menopause, but there's another explanation for the difference between older men's and older women's sexual activities. As women age, specifically by the age of 80, they have more trouble finding a male sexual partner because per 100 men, or per 100 women, there are only about 39 men. And people's expressions of sexual desires is shaped by social norms and culture. Ford and Beach observed how cultural norms influence people's ideas of what's sexually appropriate or inappropriate. For example, when members of the Songa tribe in Africa saw Europeans kissing, they said they would eat each other's saliva and dirt, which honestly, it's a little true. Um, Buss found that residents of non-Western societies like Iran and India place a much greater value on chastity in a potential partner than do individuals in Western European countries like Sweden and France. Interestingly, though, Americans are divided on if they approve or disapprove premarital sex at almost a 50-50 split. So what motivates attraction to one sex or the other? So same-sex romantic relationships develop in virtually all cultures and have done so since the dawn of recorded history. For example, 
same-sex relationships were not uncommon in ancient Rome and ancient Greece. In fact, biologists have documented homosexual behaviors in over 450 different species. It's a fun little tidbit for you. Uh, people differ in their attraction to the same, opposite, or both sex sexual partners. In other words, there are individual differences in homosexual, heterosexual, and bisexual slash pansexual attractions. Additionally, it is important to note that sexual attraction is not the same as sexual activity. For example, someone can be bisexual even if they've only had sexual intercourse with one sex, whether it be the same or opposite. People also differ in how they feel about homosexuality. For example, some people may engage in occasional homosexual behaviors but not view themselves as gay. So research suggests that as of 2003, a point two about 2.2% of men and 2.4% of women age 18 or older identified themselves as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. However, this number has likely increased because being a member of the LGBTQIA community has become more normalized in recent years. Nevertheless, even the best estimate may not reflect the general population because researchers typically conduct surveys in prisons, colleges, or military barracks or under the sponsorship of LGBTQIA friendly organizations, all of which may lead to a bias in the numbers. Since Kinsey's famous Kinsey report in the, in the 40s and 50s, scientists have acquired a much better understanding of homosexuality and challenged common misconceptions about it. Contrary to stereotypes, in homosexual relationships, many partners do not, aid, do not adopt a masculine slash feminine dynamic, meaning one partner is in the masculine role, one is in the feminine role. Most partners don't do that. Additionally, uh, the media likes to perpetuate the idea that people recruit others to be gay and are more likely to abuse children and are unfit to be parents, which is not at all true. In fact, the opposite has been found by research. Unfortunately, though, these stereotypes and misconceptions have very real impacts on members of the LGBTQIA community. One example is the San Antonio Four. Uh, this was a group of lesbian women that got sent to prison because they were wrongfully accused of sexually assaulting two young girls. And there is a documentary about this called South of Salem, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, they spent 15 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. And they were exonerated in 2016, but their records weren't expunged until 2018. In one controversial study, Spitzer claimed that most people who underwent sexual re reorientation therapy changed their sexual orientations, but there was no way of substantiating these claims. There was no way of knowing it if the participants were lying to the researchers or to themselves so they wouldn't have to undergo the therapy again. And this, of course, caused a lot of harm to the LGBTQIA community because it made unsubstantiated claims about the effectiveness of a treatment. Additionally, this finding most likely led many people to seek that therapy either for themselves or for their loved ones whose sexual orientation they didn't approve of or deemed unnatural. In 2009, the APA affirmed that same-sex sexual and romantic attractions were normal variations of human sexuality and concluded that insufficient evidence supports reorientation interventions. And this was a huge step by the psychological community because until 1973, homosexuality was considered a mental disorder in the DSM. Thankfully, social and scientific views have changed a lot since then. While many members of the LGBTQIA community suffer from high rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide, uh, this may reflect their reaction to social oppression and intolerance of their lifestyles and genetic factors. There's growing consensus that evidence-based treatments that value cultural diversity are well-positioned to help many distressed people accept and live with their sexuality instead of changing their sexual orientation. Many researchers are skeptical of the idea that people can change their sexual orientation because there are indications of inborn differences between homosexual and heterosexual individuals. 
because many members of the LGBTQIA community report feeling different from others for as long as they can remember, it is possible there are biological differences present even before birth. In fact, gender nonconformity in childhood has been replicated across many cultures, which suggest an early emerging and potential genetic influence on childhood gender nonconformity. Support uh, for this comes from twin studies that demonstrated that genetic differences account for roughly one third of the variation in sexual orientation. However, there's still a great deal of sexual orientation that isn't accounted for by genetics. When the fetus develops, sex hormones influence the brain, or if the brain sets the child on a path toward a more masculine or more feminine characteristics. According to one theory, girls exposed to excessive testosterone in the womb develop masculine brains, and boys exposed to too little testosterone in the womb develop feminine brains. <clears throat> Researchers believe this sets the stage for gender nonconformity in childhood. Some research shows that having older brothers increases the likelihood of homosexuality in men by 30 3% for each older brother, and several studies have been able to replicate this finding. Uh, one explanation of this is that male fetuses produce substances that trigger the mother's immune system to develop anti-male antibodies that affect the sex differentiation of the fetus's brain, um, with the effect intensifying after the, birth, after the birth of each succeeding male child. In 1981, LeVay found that a small cluster of cells in the hypothalamus, like no more than a millimeter, like teeny tiny, uh, was less than half the size in gay men compared to heterosexual men, but this finding did receive a lot of criticism and kind of for good reason. So LeVay examined the bodies in an autopsy and the men had died of AIDS, um, AIDS complications, but it's not likely the results were purely due to AIDS because uh, both heterosexual and homosexual men had died of AIDS complications. Another limitation is LaVey's sample of gay men was not representative, so failed replication casts even more doubt on his findings. More recent and reliable studies have found differences in the corpus callosum, uh, in that homosexual men had largest corpus callosums than did heterosexual men, suggesting that homosexuality is influenced by genetic factors because the size of the corpus callosum is inherited. However, we should consider that brain differences may be a product instead of a cause uh, in differences of sexual orientation. In fact, scientists have yet to find a reliable biological marker for sexual orientation. So attraction, uh, what are the interpersonal influences? So how can two people meet, fall in love in a world with nearly 7 billion people? So while attraction is only the initial stage of a relationship, you know, we need to feel chemistry with someone before deciding if we're compatible. Scientists suggest that friendship, dating, and mate choices aren't random, despite what popular knowledge might think. There are actually three major principles that guide this. There's proximity, uh, similarity, and reciprocity. So proximity, uh, so typically our closest friends often live, study, work, uh, closest to us. So proximity is the physical nearness to another person, which predicts attraction. Uh, Festinger, Schachter, and Back found that 65% of friends examined in a study lived in the same building and 41% lived next door. So mere exposure may explain why seeing someone on a frequent basis heightens attraction. So one study found that women who were seen more times by classmates were viewed as more attractive than those seen less. And then there's similarity, which is the extent to which we have things in common with others. Scientists have found truth uh, in the saying that birds of a feather flock together. Whether it's art, music, food preferences, education level, or values, uh, we're attracted to people who are similar to us. So we're also more likely to befriend, date, and marry compatible people. Online dating has caught on to this as well. So for example, uh, eHarmony matches people based on personality similarity and shared interest, but uh, there's not enough evidence to say they're actually successful at it. Additionally, the success of online dating is a little overstated because they base similarity on what people say they're interested in, and of course people can lie about that stuff. 
Uh, however, actual similarity seems to play or seems to pay off uh, in the long run, with similar couples being more likely to stay together than dissimilar ones. And this is why it's important to really get to know someone before you decide to marry them. Uh, similarity is beneficial to social interaction for a couple different reasons. So first, uh, when people have similar interests and attitudes, the foundation is paved for mutual understanding. Second, we'll assume or we assume we'll be readily accepted and liked by others who are similar to us uh, because we might share similar goals and achieving shared goals increases attraction. Third, people who are similar to us provide validation for our views and help us feel good about ourselves. There is even some truth to the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Research shows that what bonds friendships, especially in the early stages, is shared negative impressions about others. So, a uh, funny story, this is actually how I became close to two of my best friends to this day. Um, we lived on the same floor freshman year in our dorm. And uh, <laughs> there was uh, one group that we weren't really fond of. I mentioned this to them one day. They were like, oh my god, us too. So yeah, it, it happens. And then reciprocity uh, is the rule of give and take, which is crucial for successful relationships. So reciprocity is a norm across cultures and usually kicks in as early as 11 years old. Uh, we feel obligated to give what we get and maintain equity in relationships. So receiving personal information about someone makes us feel obligated to provide personal information about ourselves. Uh, this is why when someone introduces themselves, it's almost reflexive to introduce yourself to them. Although a lack of reciprocity will most likely make the relationship fail, complete reciprocity isn't required. So for example, if you express to a friend or partner that you're worried about something and they respond with sympathy, that's usually enough reciprocity in that situation. So physically attractive people tend to be more popular, but what exactly makes them attractive? Is it all just chemistry or is there a science to love at first sight? So while physical attractiveness is important to both men and women when choosing a partner, it's more important to men. So Buss conducted a study across numerous cultures, found that physical attractiveness was important in each culture, but men consistently placed more value on looks in women than women did in men. However, women placed more emphasis on men having financial resources. Men preferred younger female partners, but women preferred partners that were somewhat older than them. And both sexes uh, value partners who are intelligent, dependable, and kind. Evolutionary theorists believe that because most men produce a lot of sperm, they typically pursue a mating strategy that maximizes the chance of at least one of them finding a receptive egg. And because of this, evolutionary psychologists believe that men are on the lookout for indicators of health and fertility, like physical attractiveness and youth. On the other hand, women typically only produce one egg a month, so they have to be more selective. Women tend to pursue a mating strategy that maximizes the chances that the man they mate with will be able to provide for their offspring. Uh, social role theory offers an alternative explanation to the evolutionary approach. So Eagley and Wood believe that biological markers play a role in preferences, but not in the way that evolutionary psychologists believe. Biological factors constrain the roles that men and women adopt. Because men tend to be bigger and stronger, they're more often playing the role of hunter, food provider, and warrior. Uh, because in terms of the sex binary, at least, uh, men can't bear children. They have opportunities for high status positions. On the other hand, women, again, at least in the sex binary, uh, can bear children. They end up in a child, child care role and have their opportunities limited because of this. Some of these roles may explain mate preferences. Consistent with role, uh, social role theory, men and women have become more similar in their mate preferences in recent decades, possibly reflecting the increasing uh, increasing social opportunities for women. Although nature may channel men and women 
men and women into somewhat different roles and different mate preferences, nurture might shape these as well. To some extent, uh, the common phrase that beauty is in the eye of the beholder might hold some truth, uh, but it is also a oversimplification, an oversimplification. People tend to agree at higher than chance levels on what is or is not attractive. And this is the case across races as well. So uh, black and white men alike tend to agree on what is attractive. Even across vastly different cultures, men and women tend to agree on whom they find physically attractive. And men and women have preferences for body shape as well. Men tend to be attracted to women with a waist to hip ratio of 0.7, uh, where the waist is 70% as large as the hips, but this ratio is often less important than things like body weight. Uh, in contrast, women usually prefer men with a higher waist to hip ratio. According to Simmons, these findings imply that beauty lies in the adaptations of the beholder. For example, uh, women's waist to hip ratio declines as they get older, which might be an imperfect indicator of fertility. However, there are still cultural differences and preferences. For example, men from African American and Caribbean cultures tend to find larger women more attractive than men from European or American cultures do. Another example is how preferences for thinness have changed over time. So, for example, uh, back when food was a much more scarce resource, being fat was the beauty standard because it indicated wealth and the ability to access food. However, nowadays, being thin, or at least having a lower waist-to-hip ratio, is the beauty standard. And being fat in modern society is considered a negative or unattractive trait by society in the United States and Europe. So, Lang Lewis and Rogman found that being average in appearance has its benefits. They found that people usually prefer faces that are the most average, and this finding has been replicated across cultures as well. Evolutionary psychologists believe that this is because average faces reflect a lack of genetic mutations, serious illness, and other abnormalities. However, studies show that People prefer not just average faces, but average animals like birds and fish, as well as average objects like cars and watches. One study found that average voices tend to be perceived as more attractive than individual voices. And this is why so many news anchors and radio hosts sound very similar. They have average voices. Our preference for average voices might just be because people prefer average things. Or I'm sorry, the reason we prefer average faces is because people prefer average things. So according to Hatfield and Rapson, uh, there are two major types of love. There's passionate and compassionate. Passionate love is love marked by powerful, even overwhelming longing for one's partner. Passionate love is fueled by obstacles. Uh, a great depiction of this is Romeo and Juliet. And these hurdles heighten arousal and intensify passion. One study found those who experience anxiety about a potential partner romantic involvement express a greater preference for a serious relationship than a one night stand. Uncertainty about how a relationship will unfold, combined with hope that romantic feelings will be reciprocated, fuel attachment and desire. Long term passionate love is possible, but it's not common. And then we have compassionate love, which is love marked by a sense of deep friendship and fondness of one's partner. So over time, romantic relationships typically progress from passionate to compassionate love, especially in the long run. Most romantic relationships do maintain a spark of passion, though. For example, in older couples, compassionate love may be the overriding emotion in the relationship. There's also growing evidence to suggest that passionate and compassionate love are independent of one another. These two forms might be associated with different brain systems. In animal studies, emotional attachment to others is influenced largely by hormones like oxytocin, uh, which is commonly called the attachment hormone, but sexual desire is influenced by sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. On the other hand, Hate has been a largely neglected topic, 
but after 9-11, it became clear that it needed to be addressed. So hate can assume a variety of less violent but still pernicious forms in everyday life, including extreme forms of racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and homophobia. One example of this is the spike in hate crimes committed against uh, Muslim and Sikh individuals following 9-11. Without question, hatred toward individuals who are different is fueled by the internet and social media. Creating communities of individuals with similar hateful views. And this echo chamber can fuel groupthink, confirmation bias, and other problematic ways of thinking. Hatred is learned. And if we can learn hate, there is a possibility we can unlearn it. Teaching people to overcome their confirmation bias um, toward others might be the essential first step. And recognizing that there is good in everyone can help us overcome any biases, stereotypes, or hatred toward those that are different, um, like members of other races, cultures, and groups whose views differ from our own. And I do talk about this some in the chapter 13 lecture, but I want to mention it here too. Uh, the first step in overcoming things like prejudice and hatred towards others is recognizing it and doing your best to unlearn it. It's a tough road, but it's a necessary one. And then just a couple housekeeping things. Uh, just a reminder, quizzes for chapter 6, 8, 10, and 11 are due Saturday, March 27th, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time. And exam 2 is due Sunday, March 28th, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time.